Maria, it's so good to see you. And thanks for jumping on to this, uh, you know, listener feedback coaching experience. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Okay. So give us a quick introduction of who you are, where you're from. Yeah. So my name is Maria Uribe. I am a resident of Gwinnett County, Georgia. I'm super involved in the community, love living here um, as part of my professional career I've really developed within the nonprofit sector. Um, started here with a local organization, J of Georgia, and have recently transitioned to um, JUSA, which is kind of the umbrella that we're under. I'm on the development team for JUSA on the donor relations side. Super cool. And as a born and bred Gwinnetian, <laughs> amen. Awesome. Gwinnett is awesome. Gwinnett um, is great. I, I moved away for a while, came back, I probably won't leave again. So it's it's fantastic being here. And I appreciate the work you're doing in our local community as well. Um, and the, all of the impact that you're making over at uh, JA. It's really, really awesome stuff. I really, I've experienced it. My daughter's experienced it in middle school and uh, it's been some really great stuff. So I appreciate you. Um, so let's get on to the question. What is the question you have today that I can help you with? Yeah, so like many organizations at JA, we have a wide array of talent and, and that talent comes from different generations, right? And so as newer generations are entering the workforce, as some of are, are, are leaving, I think my question is around, how do we best address intergenerational communication in the workplace? Mm, so you picked a small one. You I did, a, yeah. This one. Let's that, start that, small. Yeah. yeah, let's start small. So this is super uh, relevant. You know, this is the first time that we know of in, in our society. I don't know if it's because we haven't been tracking it for thousands of years, but that we know of that we have five generations in the workforce. Um, that's, that's big. There's a lot of different personalities and a lot of different things that go into that. And we have to understand, first of all, that each generation is made up of different types of thinking because of their experiences, right? So um, what are some of the, let's just say, what are some of the experiences you've lived through in your, in your lifetime? Great question. Communication in general, I think written communication, especially things get lost in translation or your tone isn't perceived as it would be when you're in person. Um, I'm fully remote now. And so that I think adds to the, to the sometimes convolutedness that can come with, with communication. So an example here would be um, innovation. I think sometimes as, as younger folks, we come in, maybe we're tech, uh, tech savvy differently. And so I think we have this ability to come in and, and maybe automate processes or, or make things more efficient or and what in our minds better. And that's not always where maybe someone that's a little bit more experienced or has been in that position for a while in, in, in a process that's been working for them, it's not always well received, right? So um, I'm here to talk to you about strategies to, to better maybe position innovative ideas um, in, in a situation like that. Okay. So if you think about the, the experiences that you've lived through, so one is tech, right? So in the digital age now, you you said tech savvy. You've used the word tech savvy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. What what generation do you fall into here? I'm gonna, you know what? Let me pull up something really quick. Um, yeah. This is from a multi generational presentation that I do. I'm leading a multi generational workforce. Where do you fall on this? If you can see my screen. Yeah, I can totally see your screen. I love this. I am a millennial. Okay, a millennial, right? So we say they're driven but entitled, right? That's the whole kind of stigma around what it is. Now, the, the millennial generation um, was really that first generation to grow up with, with tech, right? And right. they become more um, tech savvy. They're one of the most tech savvy generations, but they're also starting to move into leadership positions and management positions and starting to shape organizations and how people are led. And when you get into the Gen Xers, which were really the bridge, right? I'm a Gen Xer. We were the bridge from the non did from the industrial into the digital, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were born without digital, but then we adopted digital as it came on. We're, we were learning how to use digital. Millennials, they were, they were kind of 
that's been there since the beginning. And now they're shaping how we use digital, right? We were learning how to use digital. Millennials are shaping how we use digital. And there's a big difference. Baby boomers, silent generation, not very tech savvy. I mean, how many of you are now your family IT person, right? Like it's like every time you go over your, your family's emails broken, right? Um, so it's kind of that idea. And so when we think about those things and what shaped that mentally, as far as the way our culture has adapted to tech, it's really interesting. So when you get to Gen Z, they're more what we call tech reliant. Like Mm -hmm. they, they have a hard time functioning without tech. And I think a lot of us are kind of starting to get there a little bit, but Gen Z, I mean, they were born with like an extra appendage. It was like a phone you know, that, that they were born with. Um, and so you're thinking about this and how do you shape this and, um, how do we, how do we deliver these, these things in a way that gets everybody on board? Cause we all have something to bring to the table. Okay. So let's go back to what you said. You said, you know, we, we can use tech well in our generation. We can do things that help bring in new processes and things that maybe rock the boat a little bit of the traditional way of doing things. And sometimes that's not really well received. Um, I'm going to show you a picture really quick. Tell me what you see. Um, I see a a shoemaker maybe with his apprentice. Okay. So old guy, shoemaker, young guy, apprentice. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that is the traditional way we look at this picture, right? Mm -hmm. But what if this kid is the apprentice, is is the shoemaker and this guy is the, is the apprentice. Mm. Do you ever think about that? No, I mean, not, not, but if I'm being honest, just by looking at this photo, but you're right. It's a paradigm shift. What if the master isn't even in this room and he said, Hey, you two. I need you to create a new way to fix these shoes because times are changing. Some things are happening here. Hey, you older guy, you bring a lot to the table because you know how we've built shoes for the last however many decades. Young guy, you don't really know those things, but you maybe have some out of the box ways of thinking about this that could maybe shape the way that we innovate our shoe industry. And so I want you guys to think together and come together and bring those things together and how to, how we can shape this whole new shoe industry. And so now they together are having to work as a team to come up with a new solution. That's great. I I think one of my biggest fears, right, if I'm being honest here, is bringing forth a a new solution. We start it, but then everyone reverts back to their old ways of doing things. Because now we're, we're kind of in this limbo where we're half doing something new, but half not. Mm-hmm. That is definitely one of my my bigger fears when I when I think through innovative um, processes or changes, particularly in my role now. I think, you know, when I first started, I was so much more invigorated. I was so new. I wanted to to implement so much change. Where now, you know, months into this role, I find myself stopping when I have some of those ideas and saying, "Wait, how is that going to be received?" How can you communicate that in a way where people hear it and are bought in and see the benefit for for them and the work that they do? Um, And frankly, I wasn't stopping as often as I am now in my previous role. Um, Because I, again, I was more in a a leadership role at at that point. I was leading some of that change. And right now I'm having to adjust to the follow but I, I, what I'm hearing from you, which is really interesting, is even in that follow, there are opportunities to perhaps lead or to, to perhaps um, bring others along. For sure. And, and, and the typical way we used to look at things in the industrial age was we, we have respect based on positional power, right? We've mm-hmm. been in this position for a long time. You immediately come in and you immediately respect that person because of the job title that they have. Now, if we go back to the generational thing here, right? Silent generation, baby boomers, they respected their boss because of their title and because Mm -hmm. they've been there for a while, because they've earned that respect by being in the industry and, and working their way up the ladder. This is the traditional way of thinking. Okay. Gen Xers started to 
kick against that a little bit because of how skeptical they were anyway with the things they grew up with, Berlin Wall and uh, respect for authority and all those types of things, right? Um, started to kick against that. And they started to say, you know what? I am going to be pretty skeptical of you because I don't know. I, why should I trust you? Just because you're this, like that authority piece doesn't resonate with me, right? Like you got to earn my respect. And then that's kind of trickled down through the millennials and the Gen Zers, right? It's, it's, yeah, so what? You've got like a VP title? Okay. Like, that's, that's cool. I respect it. But it doesn't mean you directly have influence with me just because of that title. And so that's another generational gap that is happening. And we have to understand and have empathy as younger individuals, right? Later Gen Xers, millennials, Gen Zers, that they almost demand that respect because of positional power and title and the younger generations don't see it that way. So there's a little bit of this that happens. So as, as long as we have a little bit more en empathy and understanding about where we each come from, mm. then it'll help that a little bit more. We'll, we'll read into that a little bit more, right? Um, right? And understand a little bit more. So I wanna go back to another thing you said, where you said, um, you know, some ideas may not be adapted as easily, right? So you may bring a, a, an idea to the table and I'm going to flip over to something really quick. Um, this is... And I'd like to add a little bit to oh, that yeah, as go well. Ahead. I think go that ahead. Well, I'm as, as millennials and Gen Z, I, I, I have um, family that, that's younger. I have nieces and a nephew. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that we're more accustomed to refinement and, and, you know, going through projects in a way that's like, here's what I have, give me feedback, I'll adjust. Here's what I have, give me feedback, I'll adjust, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of sort of almost like the scientific method of always trying to refine and, and not having a final product where I've found that in, in my role now, it really isn't that. It really is kind of like, hey, give me the project once it's done right? I, I don't need to see the multiple iterations. I kind of just need to see it once it's done, which has been a big adjustment for me because I mean, all throughout school and college, all the group projects that I ever did, right? Were us having different people have feedback into that project to have this like greater, awesome project. Mm. And so now what I'm finding is, is again, the responsibility is a little bit more on the role that I, that I currently hold. And so there isn't that same level of circle of feedback and refinement that I'm so accustomed to. Um, so okay. that's definitely been a little bit of an adjustment for me. And, and I, as I was seeing your chart, I was like, oh, well, maybe this is, you know, related here because of how people perceive, you know, if I'm in a vice president position, for example, and I have someone that I've entrusted with a project Really, I just need to give it the okay at the end, right? Like that's kind of how I was reading your your chart somewhat as I was thinking through that thought. That's good. Yeah. I mean, maybe in the traditional way of things, it was kind of like I'm the stamp of approval. I need right. you to go off and do all the work because that's what I did, right? I yeah. earned my seat where I am. I don't have to do that anymore. That's not my my role. Um, you go off, do that, bring it back to me, I'll sign off on that kind of thing. Meanwhile, the younger generations are more, a bit more collaborative in maybe the oh, way yeah. that they think about things and entrepreneurial, right? That whole mindset yeah. of try something, fail at it, break yeah. it, you know, try some things. And, you know, there's, there's, and that also feeds into personality. There's some of us that are risk averse and some of us that are all about it. Like it's totally fine, you know? Um, so that's a really good observation, Maria. I like, I like that thought a lot. I want to go into one more thing that is going to, um, that is going to shape a little bit of this conversation. And it really comes down to what we call self-preservation. Um, this, by the way, I'm, I'm showing you a giant OS. It's a, it's a leadership program that we use to coach people. This has 50 plus tools on it. Um, this is just one of them. It's called self-preservation. So you went, you earlier said, so they're, you know, it's maybe not, a, you know, taken well when I present an idea, you know, I may come and innovate a process and, you know, maybe it's taken well, maybe it's not. Um, what I would 
ask you, and let's run through this a little bit. So let's take one scenario. Okay. So you've done something, you've innovated a process and you're showing it to somebody and it, and it gets some kickback, right? There's some resistance there, um, which we call a wall of self-preservation right here. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're trying to build relationship and impact, but they have a wall up. Um, and I want you to ask yourself this question. This is a lesson and an exercise in empathy a little bit. Okay. So let's think about what do you think they're afraid of losing? Comfort, time, and learning a new process. Skepticism. Okay. So they're afraid of losing time. That's a good one, right? Um, they're afraid of feeling uncomfortable. Right. Right. They're afraid of having to learn something new at a later age. Because at right, as as we get older, it's kind of like, ah, I don't want to go back and learn that stuff all over again. It's kind of this, I've been there, I don't need to do this over. That's what you're for. Um, and by you bringing this on the, to the table, now I have to learn something new and I don't really want to do that, or I don't have time for that, or it makes me uncomfortable. Is that, is that right? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I also think that for me, it's been a little bit different, right? Because I feel that so much of this happens with trust as well, right? When you bring forth a new innovative process. And I think that part of me and, and me stopping myself when I, have new ideas or I want to bring new ideas to the table is asking myself, have I built that trust with this person or this team being so new and being so fresh? And so, you know, when I put myself in, in their shoes, I also often think like, hey, maybe they, and again, particularly in a hybrid setting or in a, in a remote setting, it's hard to build that trust in culture because you're only really meeting with your team during designated times. Yeah. And so I think when I look at this, I think, well, maybe they just also don't fully trust me yet or trust me as their colleague yet, or as a professional yet. Um, and so maybe it's that afraid, maybe it's that sense of not only am I going to lose time, I'm also going to have to maybe adjust to to a process that ultimately fails because this person doesn't know yet what we do, or maybe this person doesn't know yet the full process or, or what have you. So when you think about them and their position that they're in, right, an older generation, they've worked their way up and they're at, they're established now and in this role, maybe not established, maybe it's a new role for them, right? But they've worked their way up, they've paid their dues. What do you think they're afraid of losing at this point? That's a really hard question. I mean, I don't know. I feel that when you're you're in that role and you, to your point, you've paid your dues, you've progressed, particularly a nonprofit, right? Where so many of us are doing it for the impact. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen so much impact throughout the longevity of your career. I don't know that there's a lot to lose besides that, you know, the feelings of, of discomfort or let's be frank. I mean, with the pandemic, we saw this, People don't like change. They just don't. They're, they're change averse often um, because it means shaking things up and you do lose things like time. Perhaps the process becomes a little less efficient, right? While you're working it out before it gets really efficient um, when you make that change. And so, yeah, I, when I put myself in their shoes, I again, I try to be very empathetic and, and think through those different um, components but I do definitely fall back on often on trust and whether I've earned that trust and, or, or, or haven't yet. Um, and that's why I'm talking to you today to learn all these communication strategies to help bridge some of that trust and in that communication. Okay. Just, and yeah, like, and like I said, this is first a lesson in, in empathy and understanding so that we can learn to communicate more effectively and try to build that trust. Because as soon as we start to see people for who they are, they start to feel heard, valued, and understood. And then that builds trust, right? And in, in the long term. So let's paint the picture this way. I have worked my way up 
the okay. ladder. Okay. I've earned this position over time and paying my dues and doing my thing. Now a, another person is coming in, rocking the boat a little bit with the process, trying to break the mold and innovate and do some things. Okay. Now I have a wall up because I'm, I'm resistant. I'm afraid that what's going to happen. I've worked my way up. I'm feeling really proud about the things I've done in my career. And now this person's coming in and rocking the boat, kind of shaking things up a little bit. What else could you replace that with? I'm afraid of what? Um, maybe of losing a little bit of the relevancy or, or the value I bring to the team. Amen. There you go. Mm -hmm. Right. They have built their career off of something. Mm -hmm. This ideology, this thought process, this system, all of these blocks have been stacked and they're here. And now mm -hmm. you're coming in going, hmm, what if we don't need this many blocks? Or what if we change these blocks and move these blocks over here? And they're like, whoa, wait, wait, wait. I built my whole career on these blocks. You don't mm -hmm. need to mess with the blocks. The blocks are good. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, but there's a lot of blocks. We can, we can like not use this many blocks. Right. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. leave the blocks alone. Just learn how I've built my business and my career off these blocks. Right. And you're like, you know, so there, there's something there. So losing that relevancy, lose thinking that all the things I've done in the past, maybe that wasn't the best way to do it. Mm. What's that take to be able to say that? What does that take for a leader to be able to say that? Man. I would think a lot of, of self-awareness and, and confidence and trust in, in your teammates. Right. Vulnerability, right? <laughs> humility to be able to say, oh, humility just means teachable, right? If I'm humble, I'm teachable. And for a humble leader to be teachable to say, wow, maybe I'm not doing it the best way right? Maybe there is room for this, but it does take trust in order to do that. Um, so what do you think they're trying to hide? You know, I think not everyone is super comfortable, particularly with going back to the specific example of tech. I just don't, don't think everyone's super comfortable with technology um, where they are. And so when we bring forth tech ideas, or maybe they, they revert to their experience with technology. And technology has gone better over time, particularly um, systems that support in the workplace. They used to be quite clunky, and the UX was so bad on those things, and they were hard to navigate. And so I do think older generations revert to their experience with that type of technology and don't realize where we are today and how far we've come. Um, with technology and the way that interfaces can really support your work and the efficiency of your work differently. Um, so I do think that there that at times it it comes off as perhaps they're not very tech savvy. They revert to their past experiences with tech, and so that positions themselves against this wall, maybe that you have here. There you go. Yeah. Also, they've built their career again on some level of competency, right? And to get to that level and by introducing, like you said, this idea of tech and these things that they may not be as familiar with, they possibly look what? By not being able to grab all of this, what's, what are they trying to hide a little bit there? You've kind of said it. Yeah. Maybe the, the inability to, to adapt, um, to new, new tools and technology, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which causes them to maybe look incompetent, mm -hmm. right? And if they built that career level based on competency and competency is a highly respected thing in our careers, mm -hmm. looking incompetent or trying to hide the fact that I don't know how to do something when I'm at this level is, um, is something that we need to be aware of, right? Uh, what do you think they're trying to prove and to whom? Yeah, um, maybe trying to prove that to themselves that they, you know, are who they say they are. I think often in the workplace, we, when, when we have this self-awareness and when we're constantly focused on, on the self-preservation component of our careers, I think we're often proving time and time again to ourselves and to others that 
we are competent and we are able and we do deserve to be in this in this place in our career um you know to yeah i think a little bit of that is is what maybe we're trying to prove here okay good all right so this is that side okay we always need to look at ourselves though as well so usually yeah. i'll have you do this first for yourself but i wanted you to do this exercise for them first mm -hmm. so you can start to get in their head a little bit of gosh why do they have this wall up why am i experiencing this resistance what is happening why can't we bridge this gap here of understanding i'm bringing some awesome things to the table and i'm just getting kicked back all the time well once we take a moment and think about what are they afraid of losing what are they trying to hide what are they trying to prove then i can start to go oh okay well that makes sense now mm -hmm. If they are experiencing that incompetency, if that sense of being feeling incompetent, or maybe they're afraid of having to learn something new, or they're trying to prove to themselves that they deserve to be where they're at. And there's all these little things going through their heads and you're making assumptions based on this, unless you've directly yeah. heard these things, um, then it helps you be able to understand how to approach the situation. Okay. Maybe you approach the situation by saying, Hey, here's some cool, innovative things we're talking about doing right now. And we've implemented some training for everybody. And this is how we want to implement this training, right? So you're bringing a training component onto it. So we're like, we're aware that not everybody knows how to do this stuff. And maybe you're bringing a younger person to the table that also doesn't know how to do it. So they don't see it as, well, you young kids, all you, you know, you know how to do all this stuff. And as older people don't know how to do this. Well, no. There's somebody else that we need to teach too. That's that's also so it's you kind of say it's not about that, right? It's about trying to bring something to the table. Now, I want to, before I give you your homework, I want you to think about um, I want to just ask you one question. Okay. And then I want you to fill out the rest of this for yourself. Okay. What are you afraid of losing? So by bringing this idea to the table. You're saying, hey, I've got this new process for kind of innovating some things here, trying to do some things. You're getting some resistance. What are you afraid of losing? When I bring the idea and it's pushed back, is that yeah. the question? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, why I'm here today, I'm afraid of losing the the ability to continue to bring forth innovative ideas because with the constant pushback or not now, or, um, you know, pushback looks back and it looks differently um, in different scenarios. But I, I do feel that I'm afraid of losing that innovative trade and quality that makes me so great, that has propelled my career, I think, in, in such a short period of time to where I am today. Um, so I'm afraid of losing a little bit of that. And, and I think pause is, is great. Where, where I find myself now is pausing before introducing the ideas and, and really thinking things through and thinking through how I communicate them. But I'm afraid that that pause will one day just be a, nah, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to pitch it because they're not going to go for it. Okay. Um, so that's another self-preservation thing, right? I'm not even going to pitch this Yeah. because of your fear of being rejected yeah. again and your fear of not being able to continue to bring ideas because you nobody likes to be rejected over and over and over again, right? Right. right? So that vulnerability comes up. And as soon as you keep, keep experiencing that rejection over and over and over again, you're going to be more hesitant to bring those ideas to the table. Right. Now, this is where we dive into personalities where we um, at Giant teach about five voices and work on that. So we haven't di you know gotten into five voices with you yet, but um, do you feel like you're the type of person that loves bringing those innovative ideas to the table and kind of breaking the mold and blazing new trails, putting your stamp on things? A hundred percent. Okay. That is, that is who I am. Okay. So think about that. You're, you're built to do that. You've been brought into this position and your whole purpose is doing that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sitting in front of a computer, filling out spreadsheets is awesome for some people. They're built for that. I would assume you're not. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I also do love the spreadsheet. So I do love the spreadsheets. Okay. You do, might have I love both. Of that. So I do, okay. I'm the person that loves an innovative idea, mm -hmm. but I also like the blueprint, right. To, to see that idea through the project management nice. okay. side of it. I'm where I'm definitely 
not as great or as strong is the tactical and the implementation. Like I've always had really great team members that can take an idea and add to it, make it bigger, make it better, make it more functional, and then go out and implement it. I can direct the implementation all day long, the actual like implementation. There are so many logistical things that happen in that implementation Mm -hmm. that my brain doesn't, doesn't think through prior as they're happening. You're like, oh yeah, I should have seen that coming. Right. There are people that are so good at that, at at the logistical. um, And that's just not, I'm more like big picture, creative, can draw out a map all day long for you. Uh, But when it comes to the tactical, definitely not, not my strongest skill. So think about this. You're built to bring the ideas. You're built to brainstorm. You're built to innovate. You're built to put your stamp on things and to say, hey, we don't need this many blocks. Like, or we could use these blocks differently, right? If we put them over here and do this, right? Um, So when you, that, that's your identity. That's what you're built. That fills your purpose, your why, the things that you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And when that is rejected, how -hmm. do you feel? Um, but yeah, disillusioned. I mean, when it happens time and time again, do you like feeling disillusioned? No. Right. So a lot of us in our jobs, we're built to do something. We're designed Mm -hmm. to be something and to create an impact on something and someone. And when we feel locked in a cage Mm -hmm. to do and be something that we're not built to do, then we feel locked in a cage. We feel confined. We feel like I'm just going to stay here. I'll just do my thing. I'm going to, you know, eat the food they give me and just stay in my box. Right. But some Mm -hmm. of us, we all want to feel unlocked. Right. And we all want to be able to spread our wings and fly. And without that permission to be who we were designed to be, we just don't feel that freedom. So you were built to do this. You feel constant rejection over and over again about not just the things you're doing, but the person you are. Mm. So you're you're starting to go, hold on a second. They're not rejecting my idea. Now they're starting to reject what I bring to the table. And mm. now my self-worth is like, you know, there's all types of things that go right. into this. So now... Um, if we think back to that apprentice, you know, picture that we had of the young person and the old person, and we sit there and say, um, okay, looking at that, that young person may be able to bring some innovative ideas, but here's where you can start to bridge the gap where you say, listen, I can bring the ideas. I do not have the skills for implementation. You have been doing this for years. You know how it works. What if like, Again, I don't have the craft to be able to nail these in perfect or to line this up or to cut this leather the way it does. You have a beautiful craft and I just don't have it yet, Mm. but the ideas are all there. How can you help me make this real? Like put their stamp on it. Okay. Building that bridge is going to be so critical. Understanding each other's strengths and what you bring to the table is such a powerful tool, right? So you said it, I bring this stuff. I don't implement as well. How can you bring somebody in in that process and say, hey, I recognize where I'm at. I need you to help me so we can help each other build this thing. That's great. This is, this is awesome. Thank you. Good. So here what I, here's what I want you to do. Okay. I want you to finish filling these three questions out for yourself. Okay. Okay. I want you to think about what am I afraid of losing? We talked about that a little bit. You can even dive into it a little bit more. So Mm-hmm. Afraid of losing? Yeah, it's the ability to bring ideas to the table. But why is that so important? Well, because of the type of person you are. Okay. Um, what am I trying to hide? And what am I trying to prove into whom? Okay. You're in a newer position. Mm-hmm. There may be a lot of trying to prove there, right? That you need to recognize and look at and mm-hmm. say, okay, that's maybe why I continue to push. I continue to push and push and push. And people just aren't ready for it yet but is it you or is it them so i want you to think about that a little bit okay so that's your assignment these three questions continue to think whenever you experience that resistance understand that it's 
their thoughts that are that they're bringing to the table. It's not necessarily the rejection of who you are, Maria. Okay. okay? It's their yeah. thoughts and their self-preservation that is keeping them from moving forward. It's not Maria's innovative personality. Okay. Okay, so that's gonna be a thought process and exercise for you as well. Perfect. All right, is this helpful? So helpful. I have so many ideas just, just flying. Gotcha. I, idea person, that's what idea people do. <laughs> so I so appreciate you being on. This went a little longer than I thought it was going to, but hey, I, uh, I hope it helps some people out there. I wanna thank you for bringing this idea to the table because there's a lot of people out there that are bringing this question and concern to the table right now. So I think this is gonna help a lot of people. So I appreciate you, Maria. You're awesome. This is lovely. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, see ya. Thanks, Dan.